Okay, final segment four of unit four. This is going to cover the IPCC consequences, prevention, and what is being done. I also have a final note. Okay, you guys, as citizens of the planet, really need to know where to go to get information that is scientifically credible, something you can rely on as a voter and citizen. And I had to do the same thing to, to gather up the latest scientific information regarding climate change because it's ever, it's ever changing. <laughs> um, so where do you go to get reliable information? And the IPCC is where to go. It was set up, you guys, in 1988 to be an objective source of information on climate change for policymaker, policymakers, experts, and regular people like you and I. Thousands upon thousands of studies have been done regarding climate change and, and all the different aspects that, you know, revolve around that. There is no one person that can siphon through all of those studies that have been done and published um, in a scientific way and figure out what really is happening. So hundreds of scientists from all over the world, there's no bias, you know, to one particular country, there's hundreds from all over, they are um, rifling through all of the studies, you know, and the, I think there's a limit, I think it goes either three or five years prior, and they, they read them all and they come to a consensus on what the science is telling them about climate change. So all these studies are done, what are the studies saying? You know, so they're looking at majorities, they're not looking at exceptions, they're looking at what, what's the majority of the test saying. And then they put together a very long report. And the report is based on the scientific evidence that, that was presented in all of the studies that were published. It reflects the existing viewpoints within the scientific community regarding the climate change. So remember, you as voters, you as voices for the future, um, you're going to well beyond this class, you're going to be going out into the real world. And this, what I teach you now, could very well be added to or changed in the, in the near future or in the distance future. So the IPCC is a very good place to go. They have a website. They have, um, some of it can get really dry and not very fun to read, but otherwise it does present the information in a scientific way, like with graphs and charts, and those are a little bit easier to read and understand. But you should keep on top of this and be very careful about um, things that you read. Look at who is writing it, where is the source of information, where is this data coming from, how scientific is it. You know, be, be objective when you read things and look for credibility. And I, the IPCC is a credible place to go. Anyhow, um, consequences. I'm going to give you a big fat list of consequences. It's going to be cra crazy long. And as long as each one, as you read each one and they make sense to you, like think about them until they make sense to you or talk it through with someone. Um, if they don't make sense, bring it, ask it about it in the, in class the next day, you know, make sure it makes sense because on a test, you're going to see maybe multiple choice kind of versions of these. And if they don't make sense, then they are not the right option to choose in a multiple choice kind of thing. But I'm going to tell you up front, this is a, a heavy list. So if we keep progressing as, as is, and we continue our warming, this is what we're going to be facing. Um, now keep in mind, all predictions are never 100% guaranteed, obviously, because things can change. We can have positive and negative feedback loops that, that come into play, and there's so many variables and factors that influence climate that there's no real definitive way to say this is going to happen. Now, having said that, some of the consequences that I'm going to share with you, we've actually seen already. We're seeing it already. So there isn't any, you know real big question as to whether it's it's more of okay we're gonna we're seeing this how bad is it going to get now that is something that's going to be difficult to um, try to predict okay so the overall change in the climate across the globe we're going to see um, areas increasing in temperature throughout obviously because we're global warming um, but there could be a very very good probability that in some areas you could see a decrease in temperature we talked about the British Isles if that golf stream gets interrupted in its delivery of that heat to the British Isles, then that heat will not get, get delivered. 
and that can get disrupted through the melting of the, of the glaciers. Adding that fresh, less dense surface water um, can interrupt that flow. Anyway, changes in the ocean circulation patterns, like I just mentioned. The fresh water melt disrupts the North Atlantic current that, that was originally the, the Gulf Stream and can interrupt that heat delivery to Europe. An increase in evaporation, you guys, if the atmosphere is warmer, it's going to hold more um, moisture. Water vapor. With water vapor, and we talked about this, water takes the energy with it when it evaporates. It takes it with it. So um, it takes that energy from the surface and puts it into the atmosphere. So we are already seeing an increased number of storms and an increased severity in those storms. We're already noticing that trend. Um, with melting glaciers and with expansion of the water, because when water warms it expands, we're seeing a disappearing shoreline. The, the level of the water is rising. Coastal areas could be completely underwater, which also increases erosion in those areas because they have not been beat with water yet. Possible increase in oceanic algal growth. This is due to the, just the excess energy that's there. Um, as well as the CO2. Coral bleaching, they're very sensitive to temperature changes. Uh, we know that there's ocean acidification that's also happening, so it's a kind of a double whammy situation. Um, and so our corals are being slammed in many, many ways, and they're not making it. And so bleaching, actually, when they die, they turn white, and that's why it's called bleaching. We can see a higher extinction rate, which we already actually are, and changing migration patterns from spe some species that do migrate and have larger migration paths. Melting glaciers, obviously, rising sea levels, salinity changes because those glaciers are fresh, and that can also um, lead to altered oceanic currents. I also have that you cannot see changing seasons in certain areas. Changing seasons in certain areas. A few more um, evidence indicates that climate belts could shift toward the poles 60 to 90 miles for every degree Celsius increase. <clears throat> Regarding the food production, global climate models have projected a 10 to 50 10 to 50 percent loss in cropland area, which puts pressure on areas that are not naturally cropland areas. So when you think about how do you fertilize mountainous areas to make the soil growable, I mean there's going to be a whole shift, there can be a whole shift um, in that. Food production might be negatively affected by poorer soil, like I was mentioning, in new crop growing areas. The areas that are now warm enough to grow crops, whereas they used to be so cold, um, are they, the land's not fertile. Also increased insect populations. Insects primarily live, populate areas that are warm and moist. And those warm, moist areas are growing away from the equator and we're seeing a migration of the insects and some of those insects are pests and so we're seeing an increase in, in pathogen kind of things. Lack of irrigation water in some areas uh, because the water table is low and changes in the crop yields. Like what is it that they're able to grow? We're seeing the spread like the insects, we're seeing spread of tropical diseases away from the equator. Um, actually being able to travel through jet like and how many flights we have is, is also adding to that spread. <laughs> we can go from one place on this planet to another in a matter of a few hours. Um, the consequences of rapid climate change over dec decades might include, you know, this is the dun 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 part, might include premature deaths from the lack of food, reduction in Earth's biodiversity, social and economic chaos, and increased deaths from the heat and disease. This is the dun dun dun, like I said, it's the rough and tough, um, the worst case scenarios. But we, we do see a lot of bad consequences as a result of that. And this is going to be partly cut off, but tree species typically move five miles per decade. So over generation after generation, seeds will drop from a tree and they'll extend out so many, so much distance. And then those seeds grow into adults producing seeds themselves and they go out to a certain distance. So because the um, belts are moving out, the warm belts are, are extending the seeds are able to germinate in areas now where they didn't used to. Anyways, um, climate belts move faster than the trees can actually migrate and they might, the climate might move faster than the tree can make it. 
So you would have trees um, going extinct, you know, species going extinct. Okay, what can we do? All right, Mr. Polson, you told us all the dun dun dun. What is it that we can do? I mean, what can we possibly do? Well, all of these, what I'm going to share with you guys are options, not anything that I necessarily agree with or think is right, but these are some approaches that have been brought up. Um, taxing gasoline and carbon dioxide emissions, literally tacking money to it. When there's money associated with it, the trend is economically that it will go down. Um, shifting to perpetual and renewable energy resources, shifting from away from the fossil fuels that are putting some of these some of the greenhouse gases in. Improving the energy efficiency so we don't have to require so much electricity to, and, and right now, remember, most of our electricity is coming from fossil fuels. Um, slowing down our population growth. Here again, how do you do that? Is it ethical? I mean, all of these things. China has a, a process in place that they go through, but we are over 7 billion and growing. And I can remember being, teach, you know, teaching here. I've only taught here for 13 years. And I remember us hitting the 5 billion mark. I mean, we are just growing more than exponentially, right? Um, decreasing our beef demand, reducing deforestation. And if you think of all the sources, you guys, if you think of all the anthropogenic sources of the GHGs, reducing those sources. I mean, any of them would work in our prevention. Um, switching to a sustainable agriculture so we don't have to use uh, so much fertilizer, for example, so we don't have to use, we don't have to go into um, unfertile soil. So those are strategies. Now, what is actually being done? What's, what are some laws or policies that have been passed? In 1992, there was the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. There was over 100 nations, and they committed themselves to reducing the greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2000. That was quite a commitment, and when you sign on to something like this, it's not just, okay, let's go do this. It's, okay, now we need to buckle down. What technology do we have? What technology do we need to develop in order to reduce these emissions? You know, it's, it's a whole strategy, and it takes a long time to actually accomplish. Um, five years after that, or summit, there was the Kyoto Protocol that was put in place, and it at the time, it required um, 39 developed countries to actually cut the emissions of GHGs by not 1990 levels, better than that, 5.2% below that. Now, I don't know how they figured that percent, but by um, 2012. Um, developing countries would not have to make the cuts until a later date just because they lacked the, the money to develop and, and, and put in place the technologies to do this. Um, by mid-2004, it had actually been ratified by more than 120 countries, so it went from 39 to 120. Everybody was jumping on board. In 2001, though, President George W. Bush withdrew us, the U.S., from the Kyoto Protocol. We were actually one of the, one of the 39 to, to hop on board to, like, develop the protocol, but then we backed out, and George Bush got a lot of... Um, I don't know, a lot of negative press about this, and you can look at both sides. I mean, when you sign on to something like this, you have to start implementing strategies to change the, the technology. And the idea was that there was a worry about our economic status at the time, and there's still that worry. And if you put us on in that protocol, somebody's got to pay for the, the new technology. So, for example, if you if we sign on, the coal burning power plant that's providing your electricity is going to have to implement new technologies to get rid of the CO2 emissions, either inject it into the ground or get some filters or do something, and they're, they're going to have to pay for that. Well, who is going to pay for it? It's going to be the regular bill payer that's going to pay. Their bill will be higher because they have to pay for this new technology. So it's going to impact the citizens of the United States, the, the bill payers, for that new technology. And President Bush at the time was just worried about that implementation. There's still worry there. Um, so support and action is needed by the world's largest. We are the largest emitters of this, and yet we're, we haven't signed on. And this is going to cut out, and so we're going to continue this on Part B.